Hello, everyone, and welcome today. We've got Mike Brucker with us, who's going to give us an introduction to behavioral modeling with Creo Parametric. So, Mike, I'll hand things over to you. Okay, very good. Thank you, Karine. So, uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to be taking a quick look at uh, some of the behavioral modeling tools in Creo this morning. Uh, target this, uh, we should be done in less than an hour, maybe closer to 45 minutes. So we'll try and be as brief as possible. But uh, like Karine said, uh, if you do come up with questions along the way, please type those in the chat session. And if they're quick questions, we'll answer those right away. If they're more involved, then we uh, might get back to you later in the week with some more detailed responses on those. But uh, definitely if you have questions, make sure those get communicated to us so we can answer those for you. Now, to uh, take a look at some of the behavioral modeling tools, I'm going to show you uh, just a few uh, PowerPoint slides explaining some of the fundamentals about what this behavioral modeling is all about, what some of the fundamentals are. And then we'll go into the actual Creo software and take a look at how to do a few of these commands. And again, we'll try and keep this as uh, brief as we can just to give you a little bit of an overview. So what we will uh, be talking about this morning are, first of all, how to build some analysis features in Creo. Now, you might be familiar with these because there's a lot of uses for an analysis feature. But generally speaking, the analysis feature is going to go in and calculate something for you or measure something for you and then store that information as a feature in the model with parameters inside of it or variables set equal to whatever it just measured. And then those analysis features or specifically those parameter values can be used in our behavioral modeling studies where we can build what's called either a feasibility study or an optimization study. The feasibility study is basically going to ask Creo if it's possible to do something. So maybe you're building a model and you know that you want the model to have, let's say, a volume of a certain number, maybe 100. And you're wondering, is it possible to get that model to a volume of 100 by changing something? So the feasibility study, you're going to set your design requirement, like that volume of 100. You're going to give Creo variables that can change like maybe some of the dimensions of the model. You're going to give it ranges that it can change those values through, like acceptable numbers. And then Creo is going to look at those ranges for the dimensions and see if it's possible to get that volume at, let's say, 100. And that feasibility study will come back and basically say yes or no. Here it is possible with these numbers, or no, with the range of dimensions you gave me, there is no way to get that volume at 100. So a feasibility study is really going to answer the question yes or no, is it possible to do something? So maybe it says, yeah, it is possible to get that volume to 100. Well, then we could come back and also do an optimization study. So with our volume of 100, maybe we also want the model that has the smallest mass as well. Maybe there's more than one solution that gets us that volume of 100. Well, the optimization would then further optimize on some other design requirement, like in our case, the minimum mass. Then again, through that range of dimensions, it would go through this iterative solver or basically this guess and check solver until it converges on a solution that has the minimum mass. That's what the optimization does for you. And mostly that's what we'll look at today is how to set up uh, analysis features to capture information and then see if certain situations are feasible, meaning whether or not they're possible, and then try to optimize on something. That's what we'll be taking a look at today. Now, as far as analysis features, these are features in the model that calculate something and then store that information as a feature. And there's several different types that we could do. We can run the basic measurement commands, like a distance or a length, and then store that result as a parameter inside of an analysis feature. There's specific analysis features that we can build in the model. There's the mass property tool. So as we build these analysis features, like other features in the model, it's going to put an analysis feature in the model tree. And then whatever you calculated there, maybe it measured the mass of the part or the volume or a distance, whatever you measured is going to be stored inside of a parameter value with a specific name inside of that analysis feature. And then when we do our feasibility studies and then try to optimize things, we'll be able to do our studies relating to those parameter values inside of those analysis features. So that's really kind of the building block for setting up a behavioral modeling study is to set up these analysis features that measure or calculate something about the model. For example, an analysis feature might be done from the measure command. You've probably seen this tool before, but in Creo, it's possible to go into the measure tool, use these icons up here to measure different things in the model. That first one happens to be a length measurement where you pick an edge or a series of edges and Creo will come back and tell you how long the edges are. The second one would measure a distance where you hold the control key, pick two things, and Creo would measure the distance between them. 
So you can take any one of those measurements, length, distance, area, volume, and then store the resulting value as a parameter inside of that feature. Now, to actually have that make the feature, with this command, it'll show you your measurement, and then if you just close it, all that information goes away. So to store this information as a feature that you can then refer to in your behavioral modeling study, before you close the command, we would want to go to this save icon and ask Creo to make a feature out of this. It'll then put that analysis feature in the model tree. Inside of it will be a parameter set equal to whatever you just measured. And then we'll be able to refer to that parameter inside of our behavioral modeling study. You could also make an analysis by doing the mass properties. You've probably seen this one. The mass property command is going to measure things about the entire model for you, either the entire part or the entire assembly. Mass properties will come back and tell you things like the volume of solid material in your 3D model, the outside surface area of it. If you supply a density or a material, it'll come back and tell you the mass of it. Mass properties also finds the center of gravity location. It'll give you the coordinates of the center of gravity, finds all the inertia matrices as well. So all of that information can be calculated. And just like our measurement commands, if we do a mass property and we want to store this as a feature that shows up in the model tree and can be used in our studies, instead of doing quick, where it just shows you the information and then it goes away, you can change that to a feature on that menu. Then it actually stores that analysis feature in the model that you can use in your different studies. Now another tool we'll look at is this thing called a user-defined analysis. It involves building special types of datums, like this thing called a field point that's free to move around on a surface. And then you can take a measurement involving that special field point datum that's free to move around a surface. And with this user-defined analysis, we can then have Creo draw us a graph as to how that measurement changes as that field point's free to move around on a surface. So for that one, let me just show you an example. So here's a part where I have two cylinders. And I'm interested in knowing how far apart are those two cylinders at different points. So with this user-defined analysis, what I did is I made a point on the face of that cylinder, a special type of point, not a regular datum point, but there's another type of datum point called the field point that can be used in one of these user-defined analysis. Think of that field point as a point that's free to move around on that surface. Then I took a measurement between that field point, a distance measurement, between that field point and the top surface of the other cylinder. Then when I do the user-defined analysis, it's going to draw me a graph or a shaded color plot here, showing me how that distance changes. So those colors are representing how far the field point is away from that uh, surface on the other cylinder at all those different locations. So of course, the blue color is the smaller value because at that location, the point is closer to the other cylinder. And then the brighter colors, like the pink, are the bigger values, where that point is further away. So you can actually see uh, a color plot as to how that field point moves around. That one's called a user-defined analysis. I'll show you one of those in the actual software. Now, we can also do analysis to the model by writing equations, mathematical expressions between different parameters and dimensions. We refer to those as relations inside of the Creo software. So let's see. I built a part like this where I've made a solid model with a certain shape to it, maybe some extrudes and rounds, and then to make it hollow, I added a shell. And what I'm interested in figuring out is the holding capacity of this container. If I were to fill it with liquid all the way to the very top, I want to know how much would fit inside of that. Well, one way that I might go about calculating that, and there's several, but one way that I might calculate that is before I put the shell feature in, when the part's all solid, I can measure the volume of solid material there. Maybe use the mass property feature to do that. Then I can put the shell in the model, measure the volume of solid material in the hollowed out part, and then the holding capacity of that container would just be the difference between those two numbers. I could even write a formula that does the math for us. We could say the volume while it was solid minus the volume after it shelled equals the holding capacity or that internal value. So if you want to form a mathematical expression or an equation between different dimensions and parameter values, we can write this thing in the form of a relation. And then if we build that as an analysis feature, that relation that is, it would show up in the model tree and we'd have a feature that captures that information for us. We can also do studies involving motion. So in this assembly, I put together a little mechanism that moves. The cylinder is gonna spin or rotate 360 degrees. And then in that part, I took a measurement. I did a distance measurement. 
between this datum point, which is on the tip of the part that rotates, and then another datum point on the tip of the part that's fixed. So as the cylinder rotates, of course, the distance between those two points is changing. When I take that measurement, then what I can do with the motion analysis tool is have Creo draw me a graph as to how that distance between those two points changes as the big cylinder rotates the full 360 degrees. So the distance is gonna be close in the middle, and then the points are gonna get further away, maxing out when it rotates 180 degrees. So with the motion tool, you can take any measurement in the model, and then you can have Creo draw you a graph or a plot as to how that measurement or that parameter value changes as the mechanism goes through its range of motion. So I will be showing you an example of a motion study just to see how a dimension changes as a mechanism moves. Now, when we get into setting up studies and writing relations, we might find that there's a tool that'll do some calculations for us very well. If we wanna take data and do some sort of math to it, multiply it, divide it, go through some formulation, we might find that Microsoft Excel does a very good job of that. There's a lot of formatting and formula tools and editing tools in Excel. So there is a possibility to use Microsoft Excel to help you calculate things in Creo. There's a tool called an Excel analysis. And what this will allow you to do is take parameter values from Creo, like dimension values and those measurement parameter values. You can take any parameter value defined in your Creo model and you can pass it to a specific cell on your Excel spreadsheet. And then in Excel, you can take that cell and do things, like multiply, divide, write formulas, calculate things. And then you can take some other cell in, in Excel that calculated something, and you can pass that cell back in that data from Excel back into Creo as another parameter. And then you can use that value inside of Creo. So if you're writing relations in Creo and they become complicated and difficult to write and you think they would be easier to formulate in Microsoft Excel, that's a possibility. We have a tool called an Excel analysis that basically takes a parameter value from Creo, drops it into a specific cell on an Excel spreadsheet, you tell it which cell, then it takes a different cell from the Excel spreadsheet and passes that back into Creo as a parameter value. And then you can use that parameter value in Creo any way you want to. Now, one of the behavioral modeling studies that we can use is something called a sensitivity analysis. What this one's gonna do is draw a graph showing you how one parameter changes as the second one changes to see what uh, relationship there is between the two parameters. Like, is it linear? If so, what slope is it at? So you're gonna pick two parameters here, and then it's gonna draw you a plot. In this example, I'm plotting the volume of my container as I change the wall thickness. So I have the wall thickness on the horizontal axis. We have the volume up there on the other one. And then as I change that, we can see how the volume, of, not the holding capacity, but the volume of solid material in the part changes as I edit the wall thickness. That's a sensitivity plot. Just showing you how a change in one dimension affects some other parameter in the model. That could be interesting to you. That one's called the sensitivity analysis. And then the uh, kind of one of the main behavioral modeling tools we have is this thing called the feasibility study. This is the one that answers the question basically, is it possible? So first thing you're gonna do with this feasibility study is ask for something. You're gonna ask Creo, is it possible to do something? In this example, I said, is it possible to have that capacity parameter equal to 10,000? That's some parameter in the model. Now, to see whether or not we can get the capacity of this model to 10,000, I need to give Creo things that can change some dimensions and other parameters that it can change, you set up those design variables or the things that free, Creo is free to change down here as the design variables. In this example, I gave the system three dimensions that could change, and then I give it a range of values. For the first dimension, we're gonna say that it has to be between two and 20, anywhere between those values. Then for the second and the third one, we put in a range of values. Then when you hit that compute button, Creo is going to go through a solver tool, an iterative solver tool, and see, is it possible, changing those three dimensions through those ranges, is it possible to get the capacity of 1,000? And basically, once you hit the compute button, Creo is going to just come back and say yes or no. If it finds a feasible solution, it'll show you the numbers that work and say yes. Right there, you have a volume of 1,000, and those three dimensions are within the range you asked for. If it goes through the solver and figures out those combinations of dimensions will never yield a capacity of 1,000, then it just says, no, it's not feasible. That's your feasibility study. 
And then if it does find a feasible solution, the next option is to switch this over to an optimization. And what the optimization can do for you is then further optimize on another criteria. Now, here's an example of a feasibility. So I'm trying to, the one we were looking at, so I'm trying to figure out if I can get the capacity up to a certain number here. And if I let the computer change, maybe the radius, the height, the shell thickness through a range of values, again, that feasibility study will go through that iterative solver and see is it possible to get that holding capacity at exactly 10 liters or whatever number. The feasibility study really answers the question yes or no, is it possible to accomplish something? And then the optimization study will take the feasibility study one step further and then optimize on some other condition. Maybe on this one, the computer says, yeah, with those dimensions, you can get the capacity at 10 liters, but maybe there's several solutions that give you 10 liters. As soon as the computer finds one solution with the feasibility study, it says it's feasible. It doesn't look at any of the other solutions. With the optimization tool, I could come back and further optimize on some other criteria. Maybe I need it to hold 10 liters, but then I want the one that has the smallest mass. And then the computer could go through that iterative solver and further refine the results to find the optimal, optimal one that has the minimum mass, in, minimum mass inside of there. So the optimization really takes the feasibility study one step further and optimizes on something. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. Let's go into the actual software now and take a look at how we do all this stuff inside of Creo. So one second here, I'm gonna share out my Creo screen. And first thing we'll take a look at is that user-defined analysis. Here's a model where I have some sort of uh, solid pipe and just a wavy surface below it. I'm interested in knowing how close does the face of the pipe get to that surface at different points along the face of the pipe. So what I'm gonna do in this model is build one of those special data points called the field point that's free to move around on the top face of the pipe and then get a measure of the distance from that field point to the surface, the orange surface, and then store that as a group so I can do this thing called a user-defined analysis. To build the field point, there's an icon on the model tab here called the field point. When I go to define the field point, I'm just gonna pick the face of the solid and then constrain that point to be on that particular face. That's called the field point. And if I turn on the display of them, all right, uh, I see the point. Now, what I wanna do is measure the distance from the field point to the surface. So on the analysis tab, I have all my different measure commands. In this one, we wanna measure a distance. And then for the distance measurement, I pick the point. You do have to hold the control key when you pick the second reference here. With the control key, I'll pick that surface. And at that particular arbitrary point where I drop the field point, they're 37 millimeters apart. What I wanna do is an analysis seeing how that point distance changes or the distance changes as the point moves around on the face of the pipe. So I need to save this uh, distance measurement as a feature. To do that, I go to the save command up here, say that I wanna make a feature. You can give the feature a specific name here if you want. And then on the feature tab, that feature, this measurement feature, is gonna have a parameter inside of it or a variable inside of it called distance set equal to that measure distance. That builds the feature for me. Now in the model tree, you can see that we have that distance measurement feature. To be able to do this user-defined analysis, what I need to do now is take the field point and that measurement feature that I just created and group them together. They need to be combined into a single group to be able to do this user-defined analysis. So over in the model tree, I'm gonna select the field point and the measure feature, hit this icon to make a group out of them. Then I'll name the group, maybe I'll call this like surface offset, how far the pipe is away from the surface. Now to have Creo go in and draw me a plot or a picture as to how that distance changes at all the different points on the face of the pipe, I can go to the analysis tab and use this thing called the user defined analysis. It's done from this icon. You're gonna pick the name of the group that you wanna plot the analysis against. So here I called the group surface offset. And then all I have to do is hit the compute button and Creo is gonna draw me a color plot as to how that dimension or how that point dimension changes as it moves around the face of the pipe. So the bigger dimensions are the brighter color. So the point is the furthest away from the surface in that area, 
The blue color are the smaller dimensions. So, of course, at that point, it's closer to the surface. So that's just a plot showing me how the distance between the point on the face of the pipe changes as the point moves around on the face of the pipe. That one's called the user-defined analysis. That's one tool you get in the behavioral modeling package. So that's one example for you. Let's look at another one. Let me go to this part next. So here's the model. First thing I want to show you is how this part was created. So in this model, uh, to take a look at how it was built, and this could be a useful tool if you need to work on a part and you don't remember how it was built, or maybe you're making modifications to a model that somebody else created. If you don't have a basic understanding as to how that part was initially built, it's going to be really hard to modify it. There is a tool in Creole that will tell you exactly how the part was initially built. If you look on the Tools tab, there's a tool called the Model Player. With this Model Player, you can take your part, hit this Rewind button, where it's going to rewind the part back to the beginning of its creation. In other words, the screen goes blank. And then it's going to replay the creation history of the model one feature at a time. When you hit the Play button or the Next button, it's going to put the first feature in. Of course, that was a datum plane. Hit the Play button, it adds the second feature and the third one. And then we can see the first solid feature I put in the model was that. I built most of the model with just one solid feature. Believe it or not, that's one feature called the blend. I built that shape with one blend. And then after the blend feature was done, if I want to see the second solid feature, I just hit the play button, and then Creo adds a round. So I made a blend and then a round. And then after I had the round on, we shelved it. If I hit the play button, it adds the last feature, which was the shell, and we have a hollow part. So it was essentially built with three features, a blend, a round, and a shell. Now, I'm interested in knowing how much that container would hold if I fill it with liquid all the way up to the very top. Let me show you one analysis tool we have that calculates things about the entire model. On the analysis tab, I have a tool called mass properties. When you run the mass properties, hit the preview button to run it, Creo comes back and tells you things about the entire model. Like the volume of solid material in this part is about 54 cubic inches. The mass, well, if the density was 1, the mass would be about 54 pounds. The density is actually more like 0 0.03. And then when we put the right density in, it comes back with a mass of about 1.6 pounds. Anyways, this mass property feature calculates things about the entire model. So what I'm interested in capturing and storing here is um, what that uh, volume is. So instead of doing this as a quick measurement where it just shows you the numbers and they go away, I'm going to turn this mass property analysis into a feature. And then on the Feature tab, I can choose how many parameters it's going to capture. Really, the only thing I'm interested in is the volume of solid material here. So I'm going to turn off the surface area and the mass parameter. I'm going to capture just the volume. And then when I say OK, it's going to build that feature in the model, and that feature captures the volume. Maybe I want to keep an eye on what that volume number is. There's a way where you can take parameter values and display them as a column in the model tree. Let's do that for that volume parameter. I'm going to go up to my model tree settings, go to my tree columns. What I'm trying to add is a parameter value created by a specific feature. We call that a feature parameter. So as the type of column that I'm displaying, we'll set that to feature parameter. Even though I already made the parameter and I already named it, it doesn't give you a list to pick from here. So you just need to make sure you type in the name of the parameter, spell it exactly like you did when you made the parameter. And now that will add a column to the model tree that shows me the volume of the model. So it's 54 cubic inches. Now, just to uh, show you one thing about our analysis features, they're, uh, they're made as a feature in the model. And just like any feature, it's very important where they show up in the model tree. That mass property feature is only calculating the geometry that's above it in the tree. It's only calculating the geometry that's present at the point in history when I made the analysis feature. Just to show you that, let me add a bunch of volume to the model and show you what happens to that mass property feature. Let's go in and make a, a big extrude off of this surface. I'm just going to make a giant cylinder. And what I want to see is after I make this giant cylinder here, the volume before I made the cylinder said 54. Now that I make this big cylinder, we'll make it really big. Notice that my volume number still says 54. Well, I just tripled the volume, or even more than that. That should be up at like 400 now. So the reason the volume didn't change is simply because I made the big cylinder after that mass property feature. That mass property feature is only calculating the geometry before the cylinder. If I wanted the cylinder included, I could just change the order between the two features. If we take the extrude feature and put it above the mass property feature, now it's included, the cylinder is, and the volume says it's 796. 
So keep that in mind. That's going to be important for our next step here. I'm going to delete the cylinder. So now to figure out what the container would hold, what I can do is make a second mass property calculation, but do it before the model was shelled. If I go back into the point in history when I had the solid part before it was shelled, I can take a mass property calculation there, and then the holding capacity of the bucket would just be the difference between those two numbers. So let's try that. Let's take the insert here arrow, move it up above the shell. The insert here arrow is kind of like your time machine. I'm going to go back to the point in history before I created the shell. Notice the part's all solid. Let's make another mass property calculation here as a feature. And now, before the shell, you can see the volume's 963. Just because I'm lazy, I'm going to name this parameter the same name. I've already added a volume column to the model tree. So if I use the exact same name, that number will show up in the column that I've already added. So we'll say OK for that. And now I can see before the shell, the volume is 963. Afterwards, it's 54. So the holding capacity of the bucket is 963 minus 54. I could even make an analysis feature that does the math for me and shows the result. That would be done with this feature called an analysis feature. One way to build an analysis feature is to write a relation, hit the next button, and now you form the relation. Again, just because I'm being lazy, uh, I'm going to call this new parameter. This parameter is going to represent the holding capacity of the bucket. I'm going to call it volume as well, just because I've already added a volume column and I want to see the number in the model tree. So this volume, this holding capacity volume, essentially needs to equal the 963 minus the 54. To put those other two parameters into my formula, I start by hitting this icon. That'll insert an existing parameter into the formula. Then I need to tell Creo that the parameter I want to put into the formula belongs to a specific feature. I want it to look in a certain feature, being the first mass property feature when the part was all solid. There's the big volume number, that's the 963 number. I'm going to insert that par parameter into my formula. It goes in with a special code name there. And then from that volume, I need to hit the minus sign to subtract, and I want to subtract the smaller volume. So again, I hit this insert parameter icon. We'll grab a parameter from a specific feature. This time, the second mass property feature, insert that. And now that formula is going to calculate the holding capacity of the container. The formula is done. And now when we look in the model tree, we can see the holding capacity of the container is 909. Now, I'm a little disappointed. I needed a container that held 1,000, and it didn't quite get there. So, of course, I could change dimensions and see if I could get that to 1,000. Actually, let's try it. Let's go to the height of the blend, double-click that. The blend was 6. If we take the blend up a little bit taller, like 6.5 maybe, if we go up to 6.5, well, I'm closer. I'm at 954, but not 1,000. This is the type of thing, exactly, that that feasibility study will do. So I'm wondering, is it possible to get the volume, the holding capacity of this container, at 1,000? Change in dimensions through a certain range. That feasibility study will come back and say yes or no, is it possible to accomplish that? So instead of me guessing and checking 100 times, I'm going to let the computer guess and check with its iterative solver. I'm going to let the computer do all the work. So to set that up, I go to this thing called the feasibility or an optimization study. I'm interested in doing a feasibility. Again, that answers the question yes or no. Is it possible to do something? Now, the first thing we set up is what do you want to see if it's possible to do? So I hit the Add button, and now what I want to do is set the volume for my analysis feature. This is why I probably should have used three different names. But the volume from the analysis feature is the one that's calculating the holding capacity. I want to see is it possible to get that volume number up to 1,000. That's the goal. That's what I want to do. And then to be able to accomplish that, I need to give the computer at least one thing that it can change. I'm going to let it change the height of the bucket. I could put other dimensions in if I wanted to. I'm just going to give it one variable it can change. You do that by hitting Add Dimension here. Pick the feature the dimension belongs to. I'm going to give it the height dimension. And now I specify a range. So I'm going to say the height could go as low as 5.5. It can go all the way up to maybe 7. I don't want to go any taller than that. And if I allow the height to go between 5.5 and, and 7, is it possible to get the volume to 1,000? To see whether or not that's possible, I now hit the Compute button. Let the computer go through its solver. This might take two seconds like it did here, or two minutes if the geometry is complicated. But it came back and said yes. If I read the bottom of my Creo window, down in the message window, it says down there a feasible solution was found. And it shows it to you. 
So yeah, it was possible to get that volume right at a thousand. What it had to do is take the height right to seven, right to my maximum value, and then we hit a thousand. So the feasibility study is really going to answer the question, yes or no, is it possible to accomplish something? And in this case, it was. And now when I close the feasibility study, the computer is telling me that it just changed the size of my park. It just edited that dimension to accomplish the goal. So it's asking, do you want to keep the solution the computer came up with, or do you want to reset back to your old numbers? I want to keep the new ones. I'm happy, so we confirm that. And now I have my feasible solution here. So that was one example. Let's look at another one. Let's go to uh, this part. So here's a model from uh, mounting for thingy that uh, mounts on a rotating shaft. And what I want to do is have it balanced on the shaft. So around this axis, I want half of the mass on one side, half on the other side. Or in other words, I want the center of gravity to be right on that axis line. So what I'm going to do is figure out where the center of gravity is currently. I'm going to measure how far away it is from that axis line. And then I'm going to do a feasibility study to see if it's feasible to get the distance between those two at zero. Or in other words, get the center of gravity right on the axis. First of all, to find the center of gravity, we're going to go to the analysis tab and run the mass property tool. Under mass properties, as a feature, we'll have it calculate. And uh, let's have it find two things. On the feature tab, I'm interested in the mass of this, and I want to know where the center of gravity is. For the center of gravity, you can have Creo make a coordinate system there or a point. If you want a point, check this box. If you want a coordinate system, check the other box. You can check both if you want to. And now when I say OK, I'm going to get a point at the center of gravity, and it's going to capture the mass of the, the solid part here. And then maybe I want to see what that mass is in the model tree. So just like before, we're going to add a column to the model tree for a feature level parameter called mass. We type that in. And now I can see right now the mass is like 10. And then if I turn on my point display, I can see the center of gravity is not anywhere close to the axis. It's way to the left. I want to know how far apart that is. I'm going to make a measurement, save that as an analysis feature, and then I'll do my feasibility study on that distance measurement. To set that up, let's measure a distance from the center of gravity point to this axis line. Then I'll take that distance measurement and save it as a feature. We'll make a feature out of this. Now I have my feature. And what I want to see is that possible, is it feasible to get that dimension to zero? And the way that I'm going to allow it to happen is by changing the size of my counterweight. You can see I have really fancy geometry for my counterweight. But I'm going to allow it to change the shape of that square block through a range of dimensions and see if it makes the block, in this case, bigger, if we can get that center of gravity on the axis. Again, that's going to be one of those feasibility studies. So I go to feasibility. We want to do a feasibility. Then I plug in the goal. I'm trying to get the center of gravity on the axis, or in other words, that distance measurement dimension down to a zero value. So I hit the add, tell it what I'm looking for. So I want the distance measurement to equal zero. That gets the center of gravity on the axis. Now, to give it things that can change, we'll add a dimension here. Pick this uh, counterweight feature, this extrude feature, and then I'm going to allow it to change all three dimensions. We can change the height of the counterweight, the depth of it, and the width of it. Now, I have a problem here. What I don't like is how those dimensions are labeled in my study. So it's D14, D15, D16. I'm going to quickly get confused as to which one's which. So when we're putting things into a study or into a table, it's probably a good idea not to go with those computer-generated names. D14, D15, 16, that doesn't really mean anything to me. I would like to type in some more meaningful names so when I look at this table, I don't get confused and I know what they are. So before I go any further, let's just close this and leave it right where it is and rename those dimensions. If you want to change the name of a dimension symbol, what you do is bring the dimension up on the screen like this one. That's like the width of my counterweight. Click on the dimension. Then in the upper right corner, it's going to show you the name of the dimension. Right now it's D15. Instead of calling that D15, maybe I name that one width. Then I can pick on the two dimension. That's the one I'm calling the depth of the counterweight. So we'll rename that depth. Of course, just like anything else, you can't use any spaces in these names. And then for that one, I'll rename it height. That way, when I look at my feasibility study, I'll be able to tell which dimension is which. So back to the feasibility study. Now my dimensions are labeled in such a way that I can recognize them. So for the height, I want it to be able to go up to, let's say, 3. Same thing for the depth. And then for the width, we're going to allow that to go up to 4. 
So is it possible to get this thing balanced or get the center of gravity on the axis if we allow those dimensions to go up to three, three, and four? To see if that's feasible, you hit the compute button. Creo will go through its solver. Now in complicated geometry, this could take a little while. It only took a couple of seconds here. And Creo said no this time. It said no feasible solution was found. And notice that it took those dimensions as big as my range would allow, and it still didn't get the center of gravity on the axis. It's close, but the point is still just a little bit to the left of the center of gravity. So my dimensions simply weren't big enough. So if I'm willing to allow the counterweight to be bigger, maybe it's feasible. So maybe we go to three and a half on this dimension, three and a half there, four and a half on this one. And then with those bigger dimensions, if we hit the compute button, it'll see if it's feasible. And this time it says, yep. So it was able to find a solution that does get the center of gravity right on the axis, and it's showing it to you. When I close the command, it'll ask if I want to keep those modifications. I do, we can confirm that. And now notice the mass of the part is now bigger. I made the counterweight bigger to balance it. So the mass of the part is at 17.4. Let's come back and add an optimization. So I think there's other dimensions for the counterweight that would keep it centered. I'm wondering, is there another dimension combination that yields a smaller mass for the entire part? Well, to see if that's true or not, I can come back to my feasibility study, switch it to an optimization, and then at the top, I can optimize something. What I want to do is minimize the mass of the part. So now when I hit compute, it's going to go through a guess and check iterative solver until it converges on a value and give you an optimum solution. So the mass was 17.4. When I optimize and try to minimize the mass, keeping the center of gravity on the axis line still, it comes back and says, yeah, it was able to optimize it, and it got the mass down to 17.18. I was able to reduce a little bit of mass by optimizing that one. So that's the basics of the behavior modeling tool. A feasibility study answers the question, yes or no, is it possible to do something? And then that optimization will further optimize by minimizing or maximizing some other parameter. In this case, we minimize the mass of the part. All right, so let's look at uh, this example. On this model, I set up a mechanism that can move to show you how this assembly can move. If you have an assembly that has a degree of freedom, if you have components that are not fully constrained, there's a tool called the drag where you can pick on a component and drag it around. So to show you what type of emotion is allowed in my assembly here, I'm gonna go to this drag component, click on the brown part, and I'll see that brown part's free to rotate. And as it does, the other links stay attached, and that light gray block slides back and forth on the dark gray track. There's a little mechanism. So what I'm interested in doing with my motion analysis study is uh, I want to be able to view the motion, and then I'm interested in knowing how close does the end of this gray part, how close does this surface right here, this surface, how close does that get to that surface? Now, of course, the distance between those two surfaces changes as that mechanism goes through its range of motion. What I'm going to be able to do with the motion study is have the computer draw me a graph as to how that distance measurement changes as the mechanism goes through its range of motion. Now, to set all, all that up, the first thing I need to do is take the measurement and then store that as a feature. I'm going to do that by going to the analysis tab. We're going to measure a distance here, and we'll measure the distance from this surface on the gray part to this surface on the fixed part. Right now, they're nine inches apart. I want to save that as a feature. So we'll use the make feature option here. And now I can see in my model tree, I have a measurement feature that's capturing the distance between those two uh, in surfaces there. Now to see the motion of the assembly, we're going to switch applications. We're going to go from the standard assembly application into the mechanism tool. And in the mechanism tool, you can build this thing called a motor, a servo motor that can force motion. What I want to do is go in and force this brown part to rotate about that axis. I want it to be able to rotate the full 360 degrees. So here in the mechanism tool, I'm going to build this thing called a motor, a servo motor. I'm going to attach the servo motor to this axis line. And then I want the motor to spin the brown part at a constant angular velocity. So we're going to set this to an angular velocity motor. We're going to have it be a constant velocity. And if I spin the motor at 36 degrees per second and then run the motor for 10 seconds, it'll make exactly one full revolution. Now, to see the assembly move, what I can do is turn on that motor, maybe for 10 seconds, and I should see it uh, force the assembly to go through one full revolution. To make the motor run and force the motion, I build this thing called the mechanism analysis. 
What I'll do is run this analysis for 10 seconds, and as the analysis is running, we'll have that 36 degree per second motor running the entire time. So I hit the run button, it forces the motion, it goes through one loop, and now that I've captured that motion, there's lots of analysis I can do with it. One of which is just watch it. If I wanna see the motion again, let's go to this playback tool where I can hit the playback button, hit the play, and now at different speeds, I can just watch the motion. And what's interesting about this particular assembly is what happens when that block gets to the left, like right about there. Notice it appears to stop for a little bit, then it starts moving to the right. The brown part is going at a constant speed. The brown part is rotating at 36 degrees per second the whole way. So it's just kind of interesting that the gray part actually pauses for a while, even though the brown part's still moving, and then starts moving in the other direction. So the question is, is it really pausing? Or is it moving just a little bit? Is it fully still? If it's moving a little bit, how much is it moving? Well, remember, we took a measurement. I measured the distance from the end of the gray part to the end of the fixed dark gray part. What I can now do is draw a graph as to how that measurement changes versus time. And then I can look and see if that part of the graph is perfectly still or horizontal, or whether there's a little bit of motion there. There's actually a little bit of motion. So to see that, now that we've uh, set up our mechanism, what we can do is we can uh, exit out of the mechanism tool. And then if we go back to our analysis menu, under design study is this thing called the motion analysis. And with the motion analysis, I can take my distance measurement, that's between the two end surfaces, and I can now have Creo draw me a graph as to how that measurement changes versus time. And then notice what I see in my graph is the distance changes, switches directions, and this is where it appeared to pause, and notice it really didn't. So it's actually moving a little bit. It's not perfectly horizontal there. So if I wanted a little better resolution on the graph, I could have my time period just through the area where it paused to make that a little easier to see. But anyways, this motion analysis is where Creo will take a measurement, in this case a distance measurement, and draw you a graph as to how that distance measurement changes over time. That's our graph tool. All right, so let's look at uh, one more example. We have time, right? You can stop me, Karina, if I'm going too long. No, you're good. <laughs> We're good. Okay, let's look at one more then. So on this one, uh, I'd like fancy models, as you can tell. So I have some really simple geometry of a little plastic toy boat. And what I want to do on my little plastic toy boat here is uh, see if it floats in the water, basically. So I want to make sure that I want to know where it floats in the water, like where the water line is in the boat. And I also would like to get the center of gravity below the water line so it's less likely to tip over. So I'm going to do a couple of studies to see this happen. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the bottom part, the whole part here, as a part model. And in this part, I've created a datum to represent the water line. And right now, I've just made that datum one inch above the bottom. So I basically guessed where the water line is. I'm going to have uh, an analysis tool that's going to move that datum plane to exactly where the water line would be by doing a little bit of uh, physics calculation with the uh, displacement of the water and the uh, mass of that displaced water. So we'll do some formulas to calculate that. So what I want to do right now is figure out how much solid material or how much volume, I should say volume, is below that datum plane. Now, one problem with calculating that right here is the part is shell. So I'm going to go back to the point in history before we had the shell. I'm going to take my insert ear arrow up above the shell. And now I'm going to measure the volume of material below that datum plane when the model's all solid like this. I'll do that by going to the analysis tab. We'll measure a volume. Now that volume, the 26, that's the volume of the entire part. I only want the volume below the datum plane. So we're going to pick a plane. We're going to do what's called a one-sided volume where I select the datum plane. And now it's only measuring the volume of solid material below the datum plane. And it happens to be about 15 cubic inches. So what we'll do is save that as a feature. And now in the whole part, I have a feature that's calculating the volume of solid material below the datum plane while the part's all solid. Now let's bring the shell back. Let's go back to the assembly here where we have the entire boat. And now in the assembly, to figure out where the boat's really going to sit in the water, I need to know the mass of the assembly. And the mass of the assembly should equal the mass of the displaced water. That's what the physics tell us. And then we can do a little bit of math to get that water line datum plane in the correct location. So next thing I want to do is know the mass of the entire assembly. We can get that by going to the analysis tab for the assembly. 
run a mass property calculation as a feature, and then it tells us the mass is about 0.263 pounds. We'll store that as a feature called mass, and now we can see the mass of the assembly. Again, if I wanted to see that value in my model tree, I could go to my model tree columns, add a feature level parameter called mass here, say okay, and now I can see the mass of the assembly. <clears throat> okay, so now the uh, displaced water, I calculated that with the whole calculation. The, uh, the mass of the displaced water really needs to equal the mass of the assembly. So I need to do a little bit of math here. So what we're going to do is make an analysis feature in the assembly as a relation. And I know, I'm guessing my data plane is not in the right spot, I just guessed. So I want to figure out what the current mass difference is between the assembly and the mass of the displaced water when the boat, the boat sits in the water. So I'm going to call this parameter MD. That stands for mass difference, what the current mass difference is. Now, in my formula, I want to take the volume of displaced water, multiply it by the density of water to figure out what that mass is. So I'm going to insert a parameter, and the parameter I want to grab is from a specific feature. And the feature is in the whole part. It's that one-sided volume that we just measured, that 15 cubic inches. So we're going to insert that. Then we're going to take that and multiply it by 0 0.036, which is roughly the density of water in pounds per cubic inch. And then from that, I want to subtract the mass of the assembly. So I do a minus, and now we insert a parameter, which is going to be the mass property of the entire assembly. We hit this icon. Again, that's from a feature, and this time it's the mass property feature in the assembly. That's the mass of the assembly. Make sure we type that right. We did. Okay, now, if I want to see that uh, value, I called it MD, let's add another count. If it's zero, I guessed correctly, and I put the datum plane at the right spot to begin with. Likely didn't, so. So let's add a column to the model tree, again, for a feature level parameter. This one was called MD. And now I can see I'm off by 0.29. So I'm going to do one of those uh, feasibility studies and have Creo figure out where the datum plane needs to be where the mass of the assembly equals the mass of the displaced water. That's roughly where the boat should float. Now, for all the physics experts out there, yes, I know the boat could rock. We're assuming it has to remain parallel, so I'm simplifying the physics a little bit just to make this fun. But anyways, let's go to our feasibility study here. And what I want to do is see, is it feasible to get the distance, or the mass difference, I mean. So is it feasible to get the mass difference right at zero? where the mass of the assembly equals the mass of the displaced water. Is that feasible? And the way that I'm going to allow that to happen is there's a weight sitting in the bottom of the boat. I have a little hunk of plastic up there, but that little hunk of plastic is to adjust the mass of the assembly. So what I want to allow the computer to do is change the size of that little weight. So for dimensions, I'm going to go into the weight part. It's just a rectangular block. And I'm going to let the computer change the width of the rectangular block and the height, those two dimensions. The width can go all the way up to two and a half. The height can go up to a quarter inch. And then I'm gonna see, is it feasible? If you change the size of that weight, is it possible to get the datum plane in the right location where the masses are equal? So we hit the compute button, and Creo is gonna come back and tell us yes or no. This one will take just a second here. And it says yes, so it found a feasible solution. And what we'll see is uh, within a little bit of round off error, the mass of the displaced water within a few decimal places, the mass of the displaced water now equals the mass of the entire assembly. So now I've got the water line in the correct location. I know where the boat is actually going to float. So we'll close this. We'll keep the new dimensions. And then if we go to a front view, remember our mass property calculated the center of gravity for us, or it's going to, I didn't put that in. Let's go back to the mass property feature, have it make a point at the center of gravity. And now what I don't like is that um, the water line and the point, I might want those in a very specific location. Actually, I moved the water line back up. So let's run our study one more time here. I wanted to leave that where it was. There, so we can close that. And now we have our... Um, a uh, water line in the correct location. So maybe I want the center of gravity to be right on the water line. I don't like uh, where the center of gravity is currently sitting. So if I want to move that to a new location, 
I might make a distance measurement between the two and then see if I can come back and drive that distance measurement maybe to a value of zero. So we did one similar where we were balancing the fork, but the same basic idea. If I come in and measure a distance now between, let's say, that point and this datum plane, there's a little bit of separation between the two. We can save that as a feature. And now if I go back to my feasibility study, maybe I put in a second requirement. So not only do I want to get the water line in the correct location by making the mass difference equal, but maybe I want to be able to drive the center of gravity onto the datum plane as well. So is it feasible to do that maybe with some different combinations of dimensions? So to see if any of that stuff is possible. Actually, hold on, let me, uh, let me do this slightly different. I meant to do one other thing. Let's actually take these out for a second. First thing I want to do, let's do one thing different. Let's uh, just move the datum plane. I meant to do this one first. So I want to get the mass difference down to zero just by moving the plane. So let's take the plane dimension here of the waterline datum. Let's let it adjust that anywhere between like zero and one. Let's compute that one first. And then we're able to get the uh, datum plane correctly on the waterline. So now if we go back to our front view, we have the water line in the right spot. And now to drive the point onto the datum plane as well, let's go back to that uh, feasibility study here. So we've accomplished one goal. We were able to get the datum plane so the masses are equal. It did that part. Now I want to drive the center of gravity point onto the datum plane. So to accomplish that, we're going to put in a second goal. In all our previous examples, we did just one goal up here. I'm now going to put in a second one, and I'm going to say that the uh, center of gravity distance to the datum plane I'm going to say that I want that measurement at zero as well. So now we're really trying to do two things. We need to have the masses equal, and we want the center of gravity on the datum plane. And this is the one where I really want to change the size of the weight. So to accomplish that, we're going to add a dimension for the extrude feature. We'll let that change through a certain range of values. Maybe we go up to three on that one, a quarter inch on that one. So now I'm asking it to do two things. We need the masses to be equal and the center of gravity to be on that location. So when I compute this time, it's going to come in and see, is it feasible with those dimensions? This one will take just a minute to run. Or two. And it should come back. This one I think should be feasible. So it should come up with a solution where it's able to accomplish both of those at the same time for us. This one's taking a little bit of time. Now, actually, with those numbers, it wasn't quite feasible. But if we look at our front view, we're getting closer. So I just need to make those dimensions a little bit bigger, and eventually it will get feasible. I'll spare you running the yes cycle again. But uh, that's the type of tool that the behavior modeling gives you, where it runs through that guess and check and comes back and says, yes or no, can it do something? With those current dimensions, it said, no, we can't quite get the center of gravity on the datum plane. If I make these dimensions a little bit bigger and run this all over again, it'll come back and say, yes, we can accomplish that. Then if I want to further optimize on something, like maybe I want the particular solution that minimizes the surface area, I could then do an optimization and minimize or maximize on something else. Okay, so that gives you just kind of a brief introduction as to what the behavioral modeling tool is all about. Anybody, uh, so if you have any questions, uh, you can type them in the chat session. Are you catching any, Kareen? Hi, yes, I do have a couple of questions. Maybe before we go to that, can you just briefly talk about the course, where this information is taken from? Okay, sure, yep. So we, uh, if you want more information on the behavioral modeling tool, we do offer a course, a uh, two-day course that goes over everything that we talked about here. So in detail, it talks about how to set up all the analysis feature types, goes into a lot of the different studies that we can run. There's one we didn't look at called the multi-objective design study, where you can study on multiple objectives at the same time. That course would get into the Excel analysis as well, detailed motion analysis. So we do have a two-day course that goes over all the fundamentals of behavioral modeling. And we do that both in a classroom format and in an online format as well. 